Do you believe in God? I think if you asked someone today, just a random person on the street, what they thought of God, they might say, oh, I love Jesus. I love God. Most people in this country would say that. But at the same time, they wouldn't know what they were saying. Someone asked Paul and Silas when they were rescued from prison. In Acts chapter 16, verse 29, Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And look at the answer. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. What does it mean to believe in God? What does it mean to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And do you truly believe? Some people think that belief is just an intellectual thing. A lot of religious people say that if you just, if you believe in Jesus, that belief, that moment when you recognize God as your Savior, that's when you are saved. They think it is an intellectual dwelling in your mind, and that's the answer. Others think that it doesn't even matter if you believe. You're just chosen ahead of time, and whether or not you believe in God, well, you're going to be saved regardless. <clears throat> but you need a true belief in God. What is belief? Well, belief is the start of life. It is the start of a spiritual life. Look at John Chapter 20, 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe, and <clears throat> that believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Belief in Jesus Christ is the start of life eternal. But unbelief leads to death. Look at John 8, 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. On the one hand, you have a belief in Christ that leads to life. And on the other hand, you have unbelief that leads to spiritual death. Belief is a way of life. Now, I really want you to grasp this for a moment because it is one thing to just say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and it's another thing to say, I know that there is a God in heaven. People wrestle with this all the time. I don't know if there is a God. I want to know. I want to hear him speak to me personally. And then to know and look around, the heavens declare the glory of God, to just know that there is a God in heaven that's not enough either, because belief is a way of life. It should, it should drive you forward. It is the motor that propels you forward in your spiritual life. Belief implies travel. It implies direction. Look at John 14, 1 through 6. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It implies a direction towards something. You want eternal life? You want salvation? Do you want to go to heaven? You have to go through Jesus Christ. Your belief in God, if you believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. Your belief implies travel. It, it implies a direction towards something. Towards what? Well, you're going towards God, and you're going to go through Jesus Christ. 
Belief also implies obedience to God's will. Turn over to Numbers chapter 20. This is one of my favorite accounts. Numbers chapter 20. Now, it is a, it is a somber moment. It's a moment where you see someone frustrated. You see someone tempted and aggravated, losing their cool. And Moses and Aaron stand before the children of Israel. They are whining and complaining and tempting the Lord their God. And I want you to see how God talks to Moses and Aaron, but let's look at a little back, get a little backstory here. Numbers chapter 20, we'll start in verse 7. And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so shalt thou give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation to, together before the rock. Now, now here it looks pretty good. It looks like everything's going to plan. And he said unto, him, unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. You can see his frustration. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? It's frustrated with the people. You think about everything that Moses had done for these people. He had even stood in the way of God and their destruction. He had said, no, please, please save these people, please. And now he's at the end of his rope. And Moses lifted up his rod, and with the rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Now watch this. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, Moses and Aaron obviously believed that there was a God because they were talking to him. God was speaking to them directly. He was performing miracles in front of him. And to say, well, why didn't, why didn't Moses and Aaron know that there was a God in heaven? Of course they knew. They didn't believe God, though. And what does that belief imply? It implies an obedience to the will of God. Think about this. There is a God in heaven. He created the entire world. Everything you see around you is created by God. Now let that sink in just for a moment. Now, that God who created everything, he has given you some commands, some things that you are responsible for doing. Now, everything on his end has been taken care of. To the point where God himself came in the flesh and sacrificed himself so that you could live spiritually. You can have eternal life. He has shown you the ultimate form of mercy and grace. And now you have a responsibility to, the, to obedience to God's will. Now let that sink in for a moment. Now, if you believe that there is a God in heaven and you see what he's done for you and you see what you have to do, if you don't do it, you don't believe in God. Because obedience to God's will and what he has laid out for you, sometimes very simple requests, obedience to that is belief in God. And to not do those things, God would then look at you and say, because you did not believe me to sanctify me before the congregation, you will not have the reward that I would give to you. Now there is a land, there is a reward waiting for each one of us. We have to believe in God for that reward, however. It implies obedience to God's will. Belief implies action. Turn over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 24. James ask, asks a very important question. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? You might say, I, I believe there's a God in heaven. I have hope for eternity. 
I know He's there. I know what He's done for me. This is amazing. And then you sit back and you don't do anything about it. That's what He's asking. Faith without works. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit that person? This also, thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. <clears throat> you believe that there is one God. There's that word. There's that word belief. Do you believe that there is a God? James says, ye do well. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to believe in God. Isn't it? What does he say after that? The devils, the demons also believe and they tremble. Of course, they know that there's a God in heaven. But what about the demons? Are they doing God's will? No. They don't care about doing that. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that when that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. When it says Abraham believed God, what is implied in that statement? Abraham believed God. He did something about it. Abraham believed God and he went all the way even to sacrifice his own son. That's what his belief in God drove him to do. Abraham believed God and he was justified because his belief in God caused him to do the works of God. Look at Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. <clears throat> For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Look at it this way. He says we are his workmanship, something we have to do. For good works, we have to get to work. What kind of work? Whose works? Well, they're good works, which God prepared. So God has given us, not only has God given us mercy and grace to the point where we can be saved and live in a eternal life with him in heaven. But the things that he has given us to do, he has laid out and we can understand them clearly. He has prepared them for us. His good works, they're there for us. Now, if God prepared works for us, doesn't that imply that he expects us to do them? <laughs> If we say, I believe God, I just don't want to do anything that he tells me to do. Do you really believe that he is God? Do you know who God is? Do you know the aspects of God? Have you considered this God who you believe in? Look at John chapter 6, 28 and 29. Let's follow this thought for a moment. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that ye believe in him whom he sent. The work of God is to believe in Christ. That's the start. Believe in him who he sent. James 2. Then you go back to James 2 and you think, Okay, Abraham was justified because he believed in God. He was working the works of God. Well, how was he justified? His belief in God drove him to do the works of God. Look at Titus chapter 3, 4 through 8. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, it wasn't a scheme of redemption that I came up with. I'm going to develop my own way to be righteous. 
I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. I believe in God. So I'll figure it out. He says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. We heard that verse this morning. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Watch this part. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Belief should spur you forward to do something. And when you ask the average person, do you believe in Jesus? Their answer could be, oh, of course. But a true believer should have actions that you should look at them and say, that person believes in Christ. You should already know it. You shouldn't have to ask because your life should already affirm that fact. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. He also said, commandments are not grievous. They're not difficult. It's not a difficult thing to be a Christian. Think about what a true believer practices. And now I want to take a moment here to look at pure religion. A true believer practices first Pure religion. James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. If you want to do something that you know is good, visit an orphan. Help a widow. Do something for someone in this congregation that they can't do for themselves. And I want to take a moment to say how proud I am of these young men sitting on the front pew here. Yesterday, very early, they got up. It was cold. It was rainy. They got out of bed on their day off. There was no school on that day. Crazy. They get up early. They show up here bright and early in the rain. They're waiting around. And they went and they helped someone who was a widow. They did pure religion before me and other Christians. And you know what? I know, 100%, I know that this group here believes in God. Do you want to know why? Because they sacrificed their, their best day for someone who couldn't do something for themselves. They got up early, uncomfortable, and they went out and they showed their belief in God. I know they believe in God. Why? Because people who don't believe in God, they don't do that for the church. They just don't. That's pure religion. A true believer practices pure religion. A true believer also practices true worship. Look at John 4.23. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. If you keep reading, he says God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Now watch what Jesus said to her. I who speak to you am he. Jesus gave her an opportunity to stand in front of God himself. I am standing in front of you. And in the context of worship, you now have the opportunity to worship the true God. Do you believe in God? Would you worship him as a true believer? Would you stand in the congregation and sing songs to him? Would you worship how he dictated it? With the right attitude, would you put your all into your worship? Or would you just do it the way you want to do it? You know, some things are very convenient. Uh, it would be much more convenient if when the pandemic was over, we all just stayed home and we worshipped from a Zoom call. That's easier, right? It's easier 
to worship in your pajamas. It's easier to roll out of bed and open up your computer and worship that way. Of course it is. Of course it is. And I'm not saying, if anyone is watching, that you are in your pajamas. But what I am saying, what I am saying is that God has given us a way to worship. If you believe in God, you will follow that prescription. You will worship God in spirit and in truth. Why? Because he is God. He is majestic. He is holy. He is sanctified. And we should sanctify him before the congregation. A true believer practices true worship. A true believer also practices unwavering loyalty. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast for fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I like that last part, as you see the day approaching, or quite literally, as you're watching, you're waiting for it, you're looking up, you're expecting God to come back and to lift you up and bring you up with him. Your loyalty to this faith, to the belief that you profess, the faith that you cultivate in your life every day, it should be evident. But not only that, it should be unwavering. Don't ever, ever leave Christ because he will never leave you. A true believer also practices a sacrificial lifestyle. Paul said it best. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul knew that he was going to his death. He was prepared for it. He lived a life. His belief in God drove him to sacrifice his life without question. He knew that he was, he personally was a ready sacrifice. He had a mission. He was on that mission and he was not going to turn aside. Some people even called him mad. They said, Much learning has made you mad. Do you remember what he said to the people in that room? I wish everyone was like me. Maybe not in chains, but I wish everyone was like me. I'm mad, but I wish you were mad. Because belief in God can drive you to live a sacrificial lifestyle. And there is no more rewarding life in this life than a sacrificial lifestyle for Christ. Because that's what a true believer does. Think about, if you would, for a moment, the sermon this morning, if you heard it, it was on baptism. What does baptism do? It saves us. The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 asked, what must I do to be saved? Paul answered and said, You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That man accepted Christ. And people will say, if you accept Jesus into your heart, you will be saved. Well, he accepted Christ, but if you continue reading, in verse 32, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. That's what his belief in God drove him to do. It it drove him to respond to God in obedience. Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch, he said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He says, see, here's water. What's, What's stopping me from being baptized? What's stopping you is you have to believe with all your heart. And if you do, then you can obey God and you can follow his 
will. You see, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand together. Your belief in God, if, if someone asks you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Your answer can be, yes, of course I believe. Look at my life. My life is built around Christ. That's what I do. Your belief should push you towards that end. This, this afternoon, if you haven't accepted Christ where he is and said, okay, I am going to follow what God says in obedience, if you have not done that yet, I would urge you, please do that. Please respond to the Lord's invitation because it is the only thing that, that can save you. Maybe your lifestyle is not the lifestyle of a Christian. Maybe your lifestyle, you may profess to believe in Christ, but you don't profess Christ with your actions. You don't profess Christ with your habits, the words that you say. We can make that right. You can come forward, and we can pray for you, and we can pray with you. I ask that you please respond to the Lord's invitation as together we stand and as we sing.